this is a serious battle that we're in. It's really serious, really hard, but you know, the best way to deal with it is by keeping your balance, keeping a decent sense of humor through it all, and also get on your knees and pray. Every day, pray for your family, pray for our country, and pray especially, especially for our children. Welcome, everybody, to Conversations That Matter. I'm your host, Alex Newman. With us today, a very, very special guest. Uh, we have not had him on before, but uh, he's got an incredible biography, and he's been doing some research into social-emotional learning. So uh, I think this is an incredibly important subject. In fact, maybe one of the most important subjects. It has now become ubiquitous in schools all over America and now all over the world. Uh, so Dr. Robert Jones, he is a uh, PSYD, and he's got an MDiv. He's a clinical and sports psychologist. He's also a board member for Truth in Education. Actually, I serve on the advisory board there, a wonderful organization um, based in Georgia that focuses on what's happening in the schools. Uh, we've had the uh, the founder and chief of that uh, that excellent organization on this program before, talking about some of the things she found in the schools, in particular um, school lessons that were teaching kids about cannibalism and eating Babies. Yeah, it sounds like I'm kidding, but I'm not. Uh, mm -hmm. That's how crazy things have gotten. Uh, Dr. Jones, thank you so much for joining us. You're a practicing psychologist. Uh, you're in Georgia. You work with patients of all ages. And uh, what I want to talk to you about today in particular is uh, what's called social emotional learning. Uh, I think for a lot of people, this is new terminology. So why don't we just start with the basics? What is uh, social emotional learning? Well, Alex, first of all, thank you for having me with you today. Uh, social emotional learning, how do we define it? It's it's almost impossible to define. If you will go to the CASEL website, which is all about social emotional learning, you will see a lot of what is called feel good language. In other words, it's one of those things that when you just read it and you read it somewhat uncritically, uh, it all sounds kind of good. I mean, why wouldn't you want people to be learning more about social context and uh, emotional development, especially when there's been so much written about emotional intelligence uh, over the past few years? But then when you lo start looking at it in a little more detail, and this is why I have a hard time answering the question, what you find is that social emotional learning lacks what, and I hate to use a technical term, but I guess I need to prove that I went to school. <laughs> uh, it lacks what is called um, operational uh, operational validity. In other words, you can't operationally define it. In other words, if we're doing something in psychology and we're really going to study it, we have to be able to define it with tremendous precision so that we can measure it. And social emotional learning kind of gets away from that. And so what ends up what ends up happening is you end up with this stuff that uh, is sounds good, but then when you really try to get into it, it becomes something like trying to nail jello to the wall. Hmm. And it can become this vehicle to allow pretty much anything that you want uh, into a school system. And that's that's the ultimate risk of it. Yeah. Yeah. And and I spent some time on Castle's website and what I found uh, was greatly disturbing to me. I mean, I, I don't think it matters what your your politics are, but it's very clear that there is a political agenda, a of social course. agenda here. They use a lot of the uh, inflammatory rhetoric that uh, we see on our TV screens now. Uh, so what, what do you think are some of the risks of SEL um, as it's being used in schools today? Why, why should, say, a parent of a, of a child in a school today that's bringing in SEL programs, why should they be concerned other than just the difficulty in defining it? Well, uh, I think you I think you basically um, laid out some of the risks. I mean, you are talking about uh, allowing concepts like um, uh gender, different ideas about gender to kind of creep into the schools. You start talking about these programs that will 
Bert, basically every nightmare that you've possibly heard over the last couple of uh, last few months, you will get as a result of this social emotional learning. But there's an even bigger problem at play here. What you don't have in this setting is you don't have a proper educational environment for children. And let me explain what I mean by that. Social emotional learning, if you remember from the Castle website, they talk a lot about developing uh, self esteem on the part of children. But here's how children develop self esteem they develop self esteem by developing competencies, by developing successes, by developing, by, by learning, basically, learning in the way that we all have learned learning uh, about language, learning about mathematics, learning about history, you know, learning how to think uh, critically, not necessarily critical, critically like we think of with critical theory, but how to really look at something and weigh, you know, what is the truth or lack thereof of it. If you start working on just imputing self-esteem to a child and not providing them with these academic opportunities to have success, then what you end up with is this very, very vacant sort of self-esteem that's not really built on anything. And it becomes just a shell of itself. And this is how you end up in a situation like we're in now, where you know, you've had kids who've been away from school for a long time because of the virus, and they've ended up uh, having to wear masks where they can't socially interact and learn how to read facial expression. And they have become isolated from each other and basically taught to live in fear from each other. And what what we've seen then is that this artificial self-esteem, which is the direct result of these SEL programs, this artificial self-esteem has led to a, a, a just almost a collapse in the emotional well-being of our children. I, I, I think that this is to a large extent, Alex, why I have seen such a tremendous increase with children down to the age of eight, nine years old who are presenting to my office now with complaints, uh, significant complaints of depression and anxiety. And, and, you know, these, I'm seeing this to levels that in 20 years of practice, I have never seen before. And, and what are the common, what's the common denominator? The common denominator is they've been denied educational opportunities. They've been fed this program that kind of teaches them um, about uh, self-esteem that's not based on accomplishment. And so as a result, it's like it's like it's like a house of cards that just kind of crumbles on itself. And my feeling is that our children deserve better than that. That's that's kind of it in a nutshell, I think that our children yeah. deserve better than this. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100 um, percent. I want to talk about some of the the kind of values that are instilled using these programs. Uh, it, it's become very fashionable now for uh, the U.S. Department of Education and UNESCO and a lot of these other agencies involved in education to talk about the effective domain. In, in other words, uh, you know, children's mindsets, attitudes, values, beliefs and um, one of the things that that became apparent to me as I was looking through the the primary source documents on this Castle's website, Castle's the uh, collaborative or academic social and emotional learning, uh, right. really the the powerhouse in the SEL movement, uh, is that there are some values here that uh, you know some people may hold them and they may be legitimate to hold, but they're certainly controversial. In fact, I talked to uh, Jennifer McWilliams, who was a teacher in Indiana. And uh, she started speaking out about this. She ended up getting fired for speaking out and warning parents about SEL. But she said one of the programs they were using in her school was aimed at teaching children uh, to always compromise. They always have to find a compromise. And she said, you know, there, there are times that I don't want my little daughter to compromise. I don't want my son to compromise. And yet these programs teach them that compromise is this supreme virtue that we always need to find compromise. Uh, what have you seen in terms of the values that are being pushed and, and what are you concerned about there? Well, let me just address that one right there. What are they being taught? They're being taught the value of compromise. What they're being taught is Hegel. They are being taught the Hegelian dialectic, you know, uh, uh, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, which is the compromise. And, and there's a flaw in that argument. It's a huge flaw. And it's very simply this. If you accept the Hegelian di dialectic, then what you really are saying is that there is no objective truth. 
There is no objective truth. It is simply this compromise between your viewpoint and my viewpoint. And out of that will come a new viewpoint. Now, this is a fine thing to teach children if your goal is to ultimately down the road, turn them into little Marxists. Uh, I mean, I hate to be so blunt about it, but if that's what your goal is, uh, then that's that's a good way to do it. But if what you're saying is that uh, there is no objective truth, um, I, I mean, I've got to I've got to kind of push back about that. Also, too, on the other one, affective. This is a perfect you mentioned aff, the affective kind of domain that Castle is promoting. Well, again, now this is one of those things where language becomes very, very important. Affect in psychology is a very technical term. And what it means is what is a person's consistent, basically, what is the default emotional state of a person? And the de- if you'll think to the definition that you just gave on that whole issue of affect, well, that's a whole different thing. Uh, and it, it, it this is slightly off the subject, but it does trigger something in my mind that has come up here in Georgia. And that is that uh, we have seen just recently, we've had a mental health bill go through that's supposed to uh, enhance mental health services in the schools. And there are some, there are some significant problems with this. Now, I mean, I, had, I realized that many of the legislators that voted to pass this bill did so with very, very good intentions, and that this is something that's way outside their pay grade in terms of knowledge. But one of the things that this bill does is it grants to school counselors the authority to make behavioral health diagnoses. And then this is a very serious thing. If you're talking about having a school counselor who may who may have a master's degree, maybe, if you're talking about a school counselor who now is all of a sudden able to put diagnoses on children, significant diagnoses like major depressive disorder or uh, some types of uh, post-traumatic stress disorders or bipolar disorders or the more serious thought disorders, that becomes really quite critical. I mean, think about one of the implications of this. First of all, these diagnoses, once they are put on somebody's record, become almost impossible to get rid of. If you are not a person that has substantial resources, it is almost impossible to get rid of some of these diagnoses. And also, let's think of another implication. I realize this is a little bit off the topic, but let's think of another implication of that. Let's say that you uh, place a diagnosis, a diagnosis like um, major depressive disorder on a 10-year-old, let's say. And say eight years from now, when that child is 18 or 21 or whenever, all of a sudden he decides that he would like to purchase a firearm in the state of Georgia. Do red flag laws come into play now? Because of a diagnosis that may have been given to him by or her by a school counselor who may not have been as may not have been as qualified as somebody to the level of training that I would be to give one. It's a serious question. And so, I mean, it's not just a question of arguing about the Hegelian dialectic and arguing about these the, the finer philosophical points of SEL. It has very serious practical ramifications. That's one of them. The the possibility of red flag laws is one of them. But I'll give you another. If you really look at the the premises behind these uh, CASEL, uh, the, the SEL programs, they all depend on the understanding that it is primarily the responsibility of the school and the primary responsibility of the larger community to raise a child. Mm-hmm. To use the Hillary Clinton title, which she plagiarized, called "It Takes a Village." Um, it, it 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 takes a village for that for this program. What it doesn't take is parents who have primary responsibility for the raising and the education of their children. And really, in a nutshell, that's the problem with all yeah. of this. 
Yeah. And, and I've noticed that language creeping into just everything. In fact, just a couple of days ago, I was looking through all these new federal grants for mental health and these full service <laughs> community schools. And they just tell you right there that now it's the responsibility of the school to deal with the academic, mental, social, emotional well-being of the child, the dental health, uh, even their nutritional needs. They want to feed them breakfast, lunch and dinner. Yep. Uh, I, I call them parental replacement centers. And it really is getting quite extreme. Uh, and another thing that really disturbed me when I was looking through Castle's website, they've now removed uh, some of this language, but they had a history section. And they said, actually, the idea for this whole social emotional learning concept came out of the Fetzer Institute. And I looked up the Fetzer Institute. It's this very bizarre yeah. new age institution. They're disciples of Alice Bailey. Uh, very, very strange things. And they did take all that down after I wrote about it. But uh, just in incredible admission. Uh, Dr. Jones, uh, we're down to the last few minutes, but I do want to ask you sure. um, for, for parents who are concerned about this, um, what do they do? I mean, how does a mom or a dad or, or, or a family that's concerned about their children being subjected to these things uh, protect their children from this? Well, I think there's some very simple things they can do. I think one of the things they can do is make sure that when their school boards are meeting, that um, that they are at those school board meetings and that they go prepared and they and that they visit things like the castle website, that they really get in touch with organizations like Truth in Education and really, really learn as much about this stuff as they possibly can. They should be involved in the schools as much as they possibly can. But here's the real bottom line to it, Alex. And this is this is tough, but it's true. They probably are going to seriously need to consider homeschooling their children because there are so many good homeschool curricula out there. I deal with a lot of parents who will tell me, oh, but I'm not really qualified to do homeschooling. Well, if a parent isn't qualified to educate their child, then I must respectfully say that I'm, I'm just not sure who really is. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and some of these curricula are so basic that even if you say had a bachelor's degree in some, or even not a bachelor's degree, so just a high school diploma, you could take these curricula and almost read them word for word to your child, and they will get the information, the education that they need. And one of the things we know from research is that young people who have been homeschooled have better educational outcomes, are more balanced socially, interact better with adults than do children who are uh, in just our regular educational system. But you also have to be careful because the public school systems also have homeschool curricula. So you want to make sure that you're involved with groups like Truth in Education. You want to make sure that you're learning what are some of these good curricula that are out there that are based on, well, and this is my other bias from my Master of Divinity degree, that are based on good, solid Judeo-Christian values. Yeah. Couldn't agree with you more, Doctor. And uh, you really do have a, a fascinating uh, background. Um, doctor, before we let you go, what's the best way to find uh, Truth in Education? Is there a, a website, a, it is. a social media profile? Uh, it is. Uh, there. It's both. I believe uh, Rhonda has Rhonda Thomas, the executive director, has it listed on has it on Facebook. I believe it's under Truth in Education. Uh, we'll see how long that lasts. But I think the website is truthineducation.org, I believe. Dr. Jones, any final words of wisdom? Any Anything I didn't ask you about that you want to mention? Just only only this. You know what? This is a serious battle that we're in. It's really serious, really hard. But you know, the best way to deal with it is by keeping your balance, keeping a decent sense of humor through it all, and also get on your knees and pray every day. Pray for your family, pray for our country, and pray especially, especially for our children. Amen. Uh, wonderful, wonderful advice. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones. We really appreciate you coming on the program and hopefully we'll get you back very soon. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate it. All righty, folks. That was Dr. Robert Jones, a uh, psychologist and uh, master of divinity. Incredible biography there. I hope you'll share this out, folks. A lot of parents are just completely clueless about this incredibly significant issue affecting their children and their families. I'm Alex Newman. This is Conversations That Matter for the New American Magazine. Until next time, God bless you all.